What it also allows those people to do is uh, firstly to carry out legitimate business uh, during the day. You know, it's, it's not computer hacking isn't just you would learn a lot of computer code doing computer hacking. So you can do legitimate business, computer coding, you can sign games, you can get money in, which obviously will be useful for the regime. But you can also by night, as it were, you know, carry out criminal hacking from, from the same venue, from the same base. But also, I think moving overseas and being in places like China and, and overseas uh, over the borders, outside the borders of North Korea, does help those hackers to work out what's going on in the outside world, the broader world. I mean, I talked earlier on about the, the grasp that they seem to have of things like the anonymous attacks and Sony and the data leaks and how damaging it would be. Well, you, you only really get those kind of insights for the most part if you're outside North Korea's borders. North Korea is so sealed off that to understand the outside world properly and on a deep level, a deep enough level to hack the outside world, it helps if you're in the outside world. So it made perfect sense to me that, that those people would pitch up there. I'm Scott R. Anderson, and this is the Lawfare Podcast for December 28th, 2021. Despite being isolated from much of the rest of the international community, North Korea has emerged as an unexpected powerhouse in the realm of cybercrime, with affiliated hackers pulling off some of the most daring heists and cyber attacks of the past decade. For today's episode, I sat down with journalists Gene Lee and Jeff White, who have put together a phenomenal podcast series entitled The Lazarus Heist for the BBC that explores how North Korea came to play this role. Through the lens of their podcast, we discuss the origins of North Korea's interest in both conventional and cybercrime, what they tell us about North Korea's role in the world, and the ways in which they have been used as part of North Korea's broader international agenda. It's the Lawfare Podcast for December 28th, The Lazarus Heist with Gene Lee and Jeff White. I'm really excited to have you on to talk about this podcast project, which you all obviously have been working on for quite a while now, because it pulls together such an exceptional snapshot of all these different facets of activity that North Korea is involved in, both in the cyber realm, which is kind of the focus of a lot of your discussion, but also bleeding into another er a lot of other areas of criminal activity and global activity that intersect and are intertwined with some of its cyber activities people may be a little more familiar with listening to this podcast. Before we get into the podcast itself, though, tell me a little bit about this project. How did you all arrive at this as a documentary project you all were interested in doing? And where? how did you go about defining the scope of the subject matter? What What was your idea about the idea of the project going into this? And, and did it evolve? Did it change? Gene, I'll start with you. Actually, I'm going to toss this over to Jeff first, because this was his idea. Well, that, that's true. Yeah, I guess it, very originally, the, the the initial idea for the story about the heist, uh, the Bangladesh Bank heist and the cyber attack on Bangladesh Bank was something that, that I'd covered and written about. So I published a book uh, last year called Crime.com, which is all about cyber crime, lots of different cyber attacks in that book. And one of them was particularly this work of, as you've said, the the, the Lazarus group who are accused of working on behalf of the North Korean government, carrying out cyber attacks on behalf of that government. And I mean, it was it's my favorite chapter in the book, frankly. It just, it, it's, it's, it's an amazing story of how they try and attack this bank and take it down and try and steal money from it. And it just maps out like somebody's watched a heist movie, a Hollywood heist movie, and decided, well, let's just do that only using computers. And so it really, you know, I, I knew it was quite a gripping story. Um, approached the BBC with the idea and they said, uh, yep, this sounds great. But there was a whole sort of area that, that I haven't covered and don't cover. It's not really my area of expertise, which obviously is the North Korean side. Uh, and so the BBC very quickly sort of thought, well, it'd be great to have somebody who's, you know, an expert on that. And I mean, I'll hand over to Gene now, but in Gene, it, it, we just revealed this entire other side of the story, which I, I never would have thought of and couldn't have done on my own. So that's sort of where Gene came in, I guess. Yeah. So as I explained in the podcast, I've spent a lot of time in North Korea and so much of my time in North Korea coincided with the period that I call the succession period. So this time when Kim Jong-il, the late leader of North Korea, was cultivating his youngest son to succeed him. And so during this time when I was on the ground, we saw all of this science and technology being built up, promoted alongside this young man, Kim Jong-un, who we, who we now know. <laughs> and 
I was so curious at the time, you know, how was science and technology going to be part of Kim Jong-un's rise to leadership? And also, was there a, a dangerous side to all this development? And so when I was approached about this project, I jumped on it because this is something I've been trying to understand. And I, so I am not a cyber expert by any means. I still struggle to understand the tech side of it. And so I think that the way that this evolved, this, this partnership is Jeff really delving into the details, explaining how they did it, which is still very hard for me to wrap my head around at times. And then what I wanted to do was really explain why they did it, really provide that context about North Korea that we need to understand to really comprehend what motivates them. Well, you can, when you listen to the podcast, you really get that sense about there being both the cyber element, which is so integral, so complicated, such a valuable walkthrough about how exactly these pieces come together, combined with this phenomenal historical and cultural and political context of North Korea that does give that sense of motive and, and, and makes a lot of sense hearing about how this project evolved to, to see where it ended up. Let me play a clip from the show to open up with the same anecdote, the same case that you all start with, which is the Sony cyber hack, an example that I think a lot of our listeners will be familiar with. But this clip I'm going to play, which is a bit of a seasonally appropriate clip, talks a little bit about not just the cyber hack itself, which I think people may recall was a very embarrassing incident for Sony, injured their business operations, revealed a lot of their internal conversations, but also some of the broader elements that North Korea, or the Lazar Group, I should say, suspected of working on North Korea, pulled into their efforts to target Sony over the movie The Interview. So let me play this clip for you. It's mid-December 2014, and as is tradition in the United States, families are already planning their Christmas Day outing to the movies. But what to see? If you want something for the kids, there's Into the Woods. Or if you don't, there's always American Sniper. But there's another Christmas Day movie that's casting a long shadow. You want us to kill the leader of North Korea? Yes. What? Hello, North Korea! It's the interview, with its comedy plot about a bumbling assassination of North Korean ruler Kim Jong-un. It's triggered a devastating hack against Sony Pictures, its creator costing the company millions and unleashing a bunch of embarrassing headlines. Despite this, Sony Pictures still wants to release the film. But now hackers are threatening to attack movie theaters showing the interview. And that's a big, big issue because... That movie was going to be released on Christmas Day, and that's a peak time for other studio releases. And the other studios were pressuring the theaters to not allow the movie. This is Ben Weisbrun, one of the film's executive producers, he helped raise the money to make it. He's a hard-headed businessman, is Ben, and he gets how it works. You have a multiplex. The multiplex is showing the interview and a lot of other movies. Family fair, Christmas fair, dramas. If you think there's going to be violence because of the interview, you're not going to go see Snow White. And remember, this was after there was the Colorado movie theater shooting. So two and a half years earlier, a gunman opened fire inside a movie theater in Colorado and this was during a screening of the superhero film, The Dark Knight Rises. They didn't want people just to go, oh, I can't go to the movies because there's going to be a, a shooting. So you see the domino effect of chill. And while all this is going on, the film's screenwriter, Dan Sterling, is struggling with issues of his own. I was terrified and I thought, I really, really want my movie to be in theaters, but it's going to be really hard to root for this if it means actual violence. Oh, God, it was, yeah, it was really depressing when I was... I was starting to drink and medicate a lot at that point, and some of the second half of that month is a little bit foggy to me. A week before Christmas, major movie theaters refused to show the film, so Sony makes the decision to cancel the mainstream theatrical release of the interview. And Dan is devastated. There got to be a point when they yanked it from mainstream theaters, and I was driving around seeing the billboards being taken down in Los Angeles that I really <laughs> it started to get depressed. It's hard to get a movie made, but you think once the billboards are up, it's going to be in the theaters. The cancellation of the film looked like a win for the hackers, but they didn't stop there. So 
This Sony case was a lot more interesting revisiting it now than I realized even at the time it was happening because of how many different moving pieces were coming in in a way that's different than other sorts of just conventional cybercrime we have, frankly, in the ensuing years become much more familiar with. Why did this case study serve as the appropriate launching point for your discussion of the story of the Lazarus Group, other than the fact that kind of chronologically it fits conveniently towards the front end? But but what does it tell us about the Lazarus Group and the way it interacts with North Korea that maybe makes it a little bit different than just a conventional cybercrime group worthy of this level of attention? Well, I think for me, what's fascinating about the Sony attack is the sort of mix of tactics that you get and also tactics that we hadn't seen before from the Lazarus group. Because you've got to realize that the Sony attack might have been when they entered the world stage for a lot of people's attention. But actually, there was years and years of activity by this particular group going back. Security researchers have been tracking them for, I suspect, at least four or five years before that. But Sony really sort of put them on that on that world stage. Obviously, it's a huge target to attack. It did Sony immense damage, both uh, in terms of th- their computer systems, their computer networks were out of action for a period of time. I mean, even the coffee shop outside the offices was affected. It was, it was absolutely astonishing. Couldn't make phone calls, couldn't make faxes. But also there was the data leaking, as you've, you've alluded to, the leaking of incredibly sensitive, incredibly confidential information from inside Sony. And that for me was what, in hindsight, really marks this out. You know, we've had other cyber attacks which are destructive. Uh, we've had other cyber attacks where information is stolen and then leaked. What made this incredible was putting those two tactics together, destroying the computer networks. And then just when Sony thought it couldn't get any worse, this sudden, incredibly poisonous, damaging sort of drip feed of information coming out from Sony that just got worse and worse and worse. And it sort of led up to a crescendo. You know, there was a sort of staged leaking of information with the targets getting bigger and bigger and bigger until the eventual departure of Sony's co-chairperson, Amy Pascal. Just absolutely astonishing to look at in hindsight. I'm just going to add that, Jeff, I don't know if you remember this, but we really debated for, we had quite a lot of discussions about whether to open with this, where it fit into (laughs) things. Uh, But One of the things that jumped out was this is the Sony hack is something that so many people remember. And so I think with cyber, it can be hard. And there have been so many cyber attacks since then. But this one is one that people that sticks out in their minds because it did have that Hollywood element to it. There was a lot of gossip and there was a lot of uh, there were a lot of elements to it. We had Hollywood movie stars were affected. And so it made headlines and it reached the consciousness in a way that many other cyber attacks do not. And I think this one was also so interesting because it took it to the level where then President Obama addressed it. And so it really reached so many different levels. It reached the general public. It reached the cybersecurity world, of course, but it also reached that level of government where President Obama was compelled and felt compelled to name North Korea as a suspect. So suddenly, you know, of course, in our world, in the policy world, it reached that policy level, it reached that geopolitical level. And so it's, it, it, I think that it was such an interesting one to start with and an interesting one to explore. On the, on the North Korean side of it, in the North Korean element, it also revealed that they understood how we live, how we, how we view entertainment, how connected we were, how reliant we were on technology. And I think that was something that really struck me about that Sony hack. And those were some of the elements that we wanted to touch on in the series as well, because I think that that is something that's surprising when it comes to North Koreans, because there's a disconnect, right? We think of North Korea as being so isolated, and yet their hackers are believed to have been able to really infiltrate our lives. And I think there was a lot of potential to explain how it is they did that and to take us around the world to explain how it is they did that. Now, Gene, when you were describing the project, you talked about wanting to kind of get behind the North Korean mindset to get at the motive behind a lot of these incidents. And this case strikes me as one of the most interesting ones in regard to motive. You know, I think a narrative emerged around the cyber attack that kind of played into this idea of North Korea and its leadership being kind of extremely vain, kind of fitting into the mad madman sort of model, willing to do ridiculous things for the sake of their own cult of personality. And there very well may be an element of that in this picture. But you also hint at some 
other roles that this sort of attack and activity also may have played in. What what was the North Korean motive, as far as you all can tell, for this attack? And what does it tell us about its approach to cyber and criminal activities more broadly? That's a good point. My impression at the time, my memory at the time, was that this was retaliation. And being on the ground in North Korea, when I heard about the making of the interview, I knew immediately that this would be, the premise, the plot would be something that would be very hard for the North Koreans to ignore and would provide an opportunity for those who are loyal to the regime, loyal to Kim Jong-un, to show their loyalty with some sort of retaliation. And so that was that's the perspective I had from Pyongyang, right, looking at all of this. And I think there's an interesting point there. Uh, you know, we look at cyber not only, I, mean, I see cyber as not only an opportunity for North Korea to make a lot of money, which is certainly one of their motives, but also to use it as a form of asymmetric warfare, which is something that I think we need to explore as well, because this is a country that is always seeking to provoke, uh, that is still engaged <laughs> technically at war with the United States, something that we often tend to forget. Uh, but is always looking for ways to get around this armistice, this ceasefire of 1953. And I do think cyber is one of those ways. And the Sony hack was an example. As Jeff mentioned, you couldn't even buy a coffee because if you know, people couldn't lock onto their computers, they were, they were resorting to pen and paper and God knows what else they were trying to do going back, you know, 50 years in terms of technology. But that's what one of the things that I do think that the North Koreans want to do is to show us uh, that they have the capability and they'd be a poor country, but that they have the capability, that they're very clever, that they have capability to disrupt our lives. And so that's another aspect of cyber that I think is really interesting to explore and important for us to remember. And just to, just to add to that, what I found fascinating about that Sony attack was the grasp that those attackers showed of of what was going on in the sort of milieu, what was going on culturally at the time. So, for example, one of the ways they tried to hack into Sony was by sending executives and stars from the film the interview, phishing emails, suspicious emails, basically. And what the lure in the email was, look, click here and you'll get pictures of naked celebrities. And this came just only a few months after there had been a leak of nude celebrities photographs. It was an incredibly tempting lure for people uh, at Sony. And so that sort of shows... The, the folks who did this attack, they understood what was going on. They were keeping a really close eye on the headlines. And and again, you know, we'd had this lead up to the Sony attack. You know, there'd been the anonymous cyber attacks, the sort of guys with the Guy Fawkes masks, you know, running around the internet, defacing websites, stealing information, leaking information. The hackers who hit Sony, they'd seen that. They knew it. They understood it. They'd read those stories and seen that impact. So they weren't sort of hackers working in isolation in a bunker somewhere in Pyongyang, you know, they've been out in the world. They're like, yes, this is how cyber's going. This this is the new tactics. This is what we're going to do. It's very cutting edge, very advanced. One of the really interesting things you all do in this podcast is that you embed the cyber activity and criminal cyber criminal activity that North Korea is engaged in in this broader context of other criminal activities. And you spend an episode or two drilling into how North Korea has been involved in smuggling and counterfeiting things from cigarettes to methamphetamine, potentially, or suspected, although that was a case that you know the FBI and authorities were involved in didn't actually choose to get involved in, two types of products that, again, reflect uh, this union between a state's capabilities and a criminal network like very high quality counterfeit dollar bills, sometimes called super notes. I want to play a clip here of a discussion you all had with a former FBI agent talking about his experience with these super notes. The US started seeing these high quality fakes in the 1990s, and over the years they popped up in more and more places, often, it has to be said, in the hands of North Korean diplomats. And when they started washing up in the US, the FBI put Bob and his team on the case. And at some point, the FBI at headquarters contacted my case agent and said, hey, we would really like you to take a look at the super note. Through his criminal connections, Bob put out the word that he was after some of this forged currency. And sure enough, his contacts delivered. They brought me five different samples. He gave them to the US Secret Service who investigate counterfeiting in America. The first three weren't up to the super note standard the last two notes. The analysts in LA said that this money was real. 
And, and I kind of laughed. And I said, well, they're willing to sell me this real money for 35 cents on a dollar. So if you're telling me that, that this is real, I'm going to mortgage my house and I'm buying as much real money for 35 cents on a dollar as they're willing to sell me. So the notes were returned to the headquarters in Washington, D.C. for a bit more analysis. And the word came back. Yes, these two were the super notes. And there were three top secret marks on the bills that you could not see with the naked eye. And that's how you could determine the the super notes. So this idea of a super note, a high quality counterfeit to a degree that most conventional methods available to everyone except the highest levels of the US government are fooled by them, is really exceptional. It reveals this high level of technological capability before one even really gets into the cyber realm. Tell me a little bit more, Gene, about how North Korea has blended this combination of state capabilities with criminal activities and opportunities that has made it at least part of what has contributed to making it so effective in this area. What is this relationship between the state and the criminal side of a lot of the stuff that's happening as we suspect it? Although, again, I should note North Korea, of course, denies all of this. The super notes, well, first of all, it's an amazing story. And he was such a colorful character. <laughs> but I think also the going into the history also illustrates that cat and mouse game that the U.S. and North Korea have been engaged in for decades, really. I mean, some of these stories go way back. And of course, cyber is the latest cat and mouse game. I think you see how clever the North Koreans are. Also, the level of sophistication when you've got this state apparatus supporting it. And also you see what how much of a priority it is for them to find illicit ways to make money. They are clearly driven to find ways to make hard currency because they've been operating in this space where they've engaged in, in illicit activities in terms of building ballistic missiles and nuclear weapons, right? This is banned by the UN Security Council. And so they face sanction after sanction after sanction so they're increasingly looking for other ways to make the money that they need, not only to build those nuclear weapons, but to support their way of life, which is supporting the Kim family. And so getting into how important this source of money is, and also how it is they've been driven to look for these illicit ways of making money, I think is so integral to understanding why they have such incredible state support for these operations. It is just a source of money that buffets the regime, the Kim family, uh, but also feeds into this incredibly destabilizing nuclear program. And the illicit ways of making money, it, it gets into not only the systematic way that the North Koreans do it, but also the way that they take advantage of vulnerabilities in that international network. And, and, and this is interesting, too, and this is why we were able to go around the world. We, we tend to think of North Korea as being so isolated, but actually they've got diplomatic relations with dozens of countries. And they take advantage of those networks overseas, the vulnerabilities of countries that are smaller, perhaps less connected as well, and use that in this really devious way, a masterful way to make money outside the system. Frankly, some of the stories were just so amazing. I mean, really, I love that we were able to bring these to life uh, because it really does illustrate how long these agents have been chasing the North Koreans to what to the, the depths of this cat and mouse game. And some of the stories are just absolutely incredible. So I'm glad that we were able to share those with an audience and really bring them to life. Jeff, tell us a little bit about how cyber activity has grown out of and intersects a little bit here, because there is a practical element of it, which you get to in some of the later episodes in the series, which is the money laundering aspect of this, you know, getting currency or turning currency into goods that come back to North Korea. It's smuggling is kind of a two way street, so to speak, uh, in North Korea with some goods coming out and also a goal of bringing things back in. 
how does this material criminal network as more conventional criminal network, other activities intersect with the cyber capabilities North Korea has developed and, and is continuing to develop? Yeah, it's a really interesting question. I mean, the, the, the cyber side, obviously for me, is endlessly fascinating. And the, the sort of ingenuity and creativity with which the computer hackers break into organizations time and time again is sort of endlessly fascinating. I have a sort of grudging almost respect for that. But what's interesting is often the hack doesn't take that long. It's not too sophisticated in terms of the tactics, obviously sophisticated in terms of the tools that are used, but, but the break-in can be quite quick, you know, and then suddenly they're in, they've got the money and they're off. The problem thereafter is what do you do with that money? You know, where do you take it? Where do you put it? You can't just transfer it to the bank account of Kim Jong-un, uh, if indeed he is behind it all, because it's going to be pretty obvious who did it. So there's still this attempt to sort of obfuscate the money trail. And what that means is working with people who don't necessarily even know that they're working with North Korean computer hackers and probably wouldn't even care even if they did. People who basically are experts in moving money around the world, obfuscating its trail, getting it in and out of jurisdictions. And of course, the more jurisdictions you move it across and through, the harder it is for law enforcement to chase after it. So one of the stories that um, we didn't do in series one, but maybe for a series two, is an attack on an, an Indian bank, after which the hackers managed to, to, to get money out of cash points in 29 different countries. Now, speaking to the Indian police officers trying to chase that down, they've got to fill out forms for 29 different countries for things like mutual uh, legal assistance and so on. That's a huge amount of bureaucracy. And for the hackers, for the, for the criminals, of course, you know, their computer networks span the globe, their networks span the globe of people and operatives. So for them, 29 different countries is a challenge, but not insurmountable. For police officers in India, that is a huge challenge and possibly an insurmountable one in terms of investigating the crime. So what you see is this ability of computer hackers to work almost seamlessly with kind of criminal contacts they pick up along the way. And also for those networks, both the hacking networks and the traditional criminal networks, to work seamlessly internationally in a way that just absolutely uh, frustrates attempts by law enforcement bodies to, to chase after them. And this has been really the, the confluence, watching the confluence of those worlds has been absolutely fascinating. There's more cases, again, off the back of that Indian bank job uh, that point to the completely remarkable links that get set up between criminals that you never would have thought would ever get involved with, with North Korean hackers. Can I just add to that? There is this whole layer of middlemen and middle women, I should say. I mentioned that because we, Jeff and I haven't really discussed this ourselves, but one thing I noticed that there is a pattern with some of the criminal activity pinned on the North Koreans, which is that it's often women who end up being, what's the, what's the phrase? They're the ones end up holding the bag. Is that the right? In that <laughs> yes, ice language. Yeah. Uh, and so it's just, it's really, it was just something that we didn't really get into, but the number of cases where not only in the cyber realm, but with the assassination of Kim Jong-nam in Malaysia, for example, the two young women who were unwittingly duped into carrying out these crimes, we see this pattern over and over. And there's a part of me that just the suspected North Koreans are just really savvy at um, using those middlemen for their purposes. And often these middlemen are just completely, as Jeff says, unaware who it is they're working for. So there is that interesting element as well of how how North Koreans are sent out into the world, into the, it, two different countries to try to line all this up. And in the, in the context of the Lazarus Heist, it was to get that money back to Pyongyang. But then there are a lot of people who are implicated in this along the way. And that I think has been interesting as well. Really tragic in, in some cases for some of these people, but just interesting how much they managed to infiltrate into these societies uh, in countries, as I said earlier, are very vulnerable, where the, where the countries where the systems are weak and the people are very vulnerable. That's a perfect segue into this next clip I want to play, which is another one of these interviews uh, with someone who has found themselves unexpectedly in the middle of a hub for this criminal cyber activity while on a trip to China. Let me play that for you. There's a hotel in China called the Chilbasan. It's in one of the country's biggest cities, Shenyang in the Northeast. From the outside, it just looks like your classic Asian business establishment. 
complete with a couple of stone tigers flanking the front door. I've seen the reviews and the photos, and they're not bad. The hotel is centrally located, and the rooms are bright and clean. Free Wi-Fi, it's got a minibar. Overall, it's a pretty reasonable option for, say, an American businessman who needs a place for the night. Like this man we're calling Mark. He's operated for years in China, where talking to the foreign press is frowned upon, so he's asked us not to use his real name. During one of his business trips to China, Mark ends up in Shenyang for a few meetings. He's had a long day. A Chinese colleague has booked him into a hotel for the night, the Chilbosan Hotel. It was a beautiful lobby, and all the staff was you know, dressed well, very attentive to you know, the people's needs coming in to check in. But as he checks in, he can't help but notice some furtive glances from the staff, and it gets even worse when he steps into the elevator. And we stopped on a kind of an intermediate floor. The door opened. You know, some of the other hotel visitors kind of looked very surprised. Wow, who's this guy? Kind of, you know, taking a step back, literally, and, and looked at me and completely shocked. And I thought, well, that's kind of strange. They got in the uh, elevator and, and they kind of separated themselves a little bit off to the side, but it was just dead silence. At this point, Mark starts to get nervous and takes out his phone to do a bit of research on this Chilbasan hotel. There was some comment that this was involved in some of the hackings at Sony. I know there was some tension between the U.S. and North Korea around that whole incident. And that's when I discovered that this was no one has the uh, hacker hotel. He may be in China, but Mark has ended up in a hotel run by North Koreans. I guess he didn't notice the name written in Korean outside, but Chilbosan is distinctly North Korean. The name means Mountain of Seven Treasures. That is one of North Korea's most famous scenic sites. So it's a nice mystical name, but this hotel hides a dark secret, at least according to intelligence agencies. They say this is where the Lazarus Group, North Korea's elite hacking unit, or at least some of its members, carried out some of their cyber attacks. Hence the nickname, the Hackers Hotel. Jeff, let me turn to you on this first. This hacker hotel that this gentleman finds himself in unexpectedly in China is such an interesting anecdote. And it really is a core part of this whole ecosystem of cultivating hacker talent and individual hackers themselves that North Korea has set up, starting with you know primary school education in a way, and then leading to a whole career path, if one can call that, though not always a voluntary career path that's set out for them, um, that often integrates these overseas presences. Tell me a little bit more about that story. Where do, does North Korea get these hackers? How does it develop this pretty high level of talent that it appears to have? And then how are they able to operate internationally through avenues like this hotel? Well, I think Gene can expand on the on the, the sort of training of the hackers and how that those people come up through the system, which is a really fascinating story. But in terms of the mechanics of sending those hackers overseas, there's a really good reason why North Korea might do that. Um, North Korea's connection to the internet is quite thin. You know, in a country like the UK, the US, there'll be, you know, millions of links to, to the internet, millions of IP addresses. Uh, North Korea has a fairly narrow window to the internet. And obviously that window is one of the most surveilled windows uh, in the world. Everybody wants to try and work out what's going in and out of North Korea. So if you're hacking from inside North Korea, that's a really dumb bet because you're probably going to get tracked back there fairly, fairly quickly. So what's often the case is hackers will be sent sent overseas, often over the border to China, um, still a, an ally of North Korea, and that the hacking will be done from there. And of course, you hide within the crowd, you hide within those millions of IP addresses that, that trace back to China. But it also allows those people to do is uh, firstly to carry out legitimate business uh, during the day. You know, it's, it's not computer hacking isn't just, you would learn a lot of computer code doing computer hacking. So you can do legitimate business, computer coding, you can design games, you can get money in, which obviously will be useful for the regime. But you can also so by night, as it were, you know, carry out the sort of criminal hacking from, from the same venue, from the same base. But also, I think moving overseas and being in places like China and, and overseas, uh, over the borders, outside the borders of North Korea, does help those hackers to work out what's going on in the outside world, the broader world. I mean, I talked earlier on about the, the grasp that they seem to have of things like the anonymous attacks and Sony and the data leaks and how damaging it would be. Well, you, you only really get those kind of insights 
for the most part, if you're outside North Korea's borders, North Korea is so sealed off that to understand the outside world properly and on a deep level, a deep enough level to hack the outside world, it helps if you're in the outside world. So it made perfect sense to me that that those people would pitch up there. And talking about IP addresses, I've, I've mentioned that just, just for the non-technical audience, that's your sort of computer's address on the internet. It's your computer's window to the internet, if you like. And what tr what what revealed that hotel, the Chilbasan Hotel uh, in China, as being a potential hacker hangout, uh, was that when the cyber attacks were carried out, uh, investigators, including the FBI, traced back the IP addresses. And sometimes an IP address can trace back to an individual building, and that is the allegation here that that individual building was where some of those cyber attacks were, were launched from. So, in a way, it makes sort of perfect sense that it would become known as the as the hacker hotel. But Gene, I mean, I, I don't really want to pick up on that in terms of the, the genesis of these hackers and how they come up through North Korean society because that's that's fascinating as well. Yeah, but just going back to the hacker hotel itself, I wish that I had been able to visit the hotel. I mean, it's so funny, the story with this American businessman, because you can book this hotel, you could at the time book this hotel on Agoda or one of these sites, and we looked it up and you, it looks like a perfectly normal hotel. But if you're, you know, if you're me and you you won't, you know North Korea, you know, you see the signs, right? You, Shilbo San is, a, is an iconic mountain range in North Korea. You know, there are so many signs that this is actually a North Korean operation. And yet they were operating in daylight, completely like an, any other hotel. I just wish that I had had the chance to see the hotel myself. But going back, absolutely, you know, North Korea, as many people know, is pretty cut off. You've got um, Pyongyang and about 2 million people living in Pyongyang. The country is, has a population of 25 million total. So it's really uh, the elites. We, we, we call them the elites because it really is a small segment of the population that is lucky enough. There isn't, they don't have freedom of movement. So you can't just move anywhere you want or live anywhere you want in Pyongyang. And so it is a huge luxury in a sense. It's all relative, but it is, it, it's a, a, a matter of prestige to be able to live in Pyongyang. Even within Pyongyang, I would say life is pretty difficult. They have a lot of power outages electricity and heat are still in short supply, even in Pyongyang. But computers, that's something that Kim Jong-un has really promoted since he took power 10 years ago. So we did start to see computers appear and they all have these little, this little red plaque on them to show that they're a gift from the Kims. And we did start to see around that time, I would say, if you look at the trajectory, a lot of cultivation of these young minds of the, that next generation of North Koreans picking out math geniuses, putting them in intensive training to turn them into these scientific prodigies. We saw North Koreans excelling at math Olympiads. We have a whole, we have an episode that focuses on how that becomes one route and to really focus on train them on first becoming these math geniuses and then later on to become very adept in computer science. Now, North Koreans can't, they don't have the same kind of freedom that we have in the West to pick and choose what they want to do. And so if you're plucked to cultivate or to develop a certain talent, it really is really hard to say no. It's really hard to turn that down. Often it does mean that you will have a better life. And so it's a, it's a, difficult, uh, it's a difficult proposition to turn down. Now, one thing that we also saw with Kim Jong-un is that he started to send some of his young people abroad. It hasn't always been the case that North Koreans could go abroad, but I do think that he recognized that in order to execute this part of his strategy, and that includes trying to cultivate a more sophisticated population, he needed to send them abroad because in North Korea, you have a limited power supply, very few computers, as Jeff mentioned, the internet is very limited. So anything you're doing on the internet is not only going to be monitored by the North Koreans, but also monitored by the rest of the world. I mean, I, I was very self-conscious when I was using the, the internet in North Korea because I did see some studies suggesting that people were Googling certain terms. And I thought, listen, this is us. This is me Googling. You're including me with the North Koreans. You have to understand that the North Korean, there are very few North Koreans with actual access to the to the internet and so china became a 
a rite of passage really for young North Koreans to spend some time in China. It was an opportunity for them to see how, what life was like outside North Korea, to develop some new skills, to really develop an understanding of how business is done outside the country. And so when you think about how much these young hackers relied on this opportunity, you can see how it was they were able to develop this sense and understanding of how we live, how, how reliant we are on the internet. You know, as we mentioned, what kind of entertainment, who the movie stars were, how we use email, how we use LinkedIn. I mean, these are things that they would not be able to access from North Korea. And so looking at that, these hacker hotels or these, these places where these young men spend years just studying us as well as mapping out these strategies was fascinating. I think one of the most interesting recurring themes that you all hit on for people, particularly for people who may not follow North Korean affairs that closely and are working off some assumptions and stereotypes they may have about North Korea being extremely isolated country, is the degree to which, despite being isolated in very real ways on a lot of fronts, a lot of these activities rely heavily upon a pretty dense international network and to some degree, international, not partners, but accommodations, international willingness for, for certain activity that take place in China and other places. I want to play another clip now, focusing on one avenue and one some historical context for one of these relationships uh, that people may not be fully aware of that's played a role in this story that you're, you've told here, which is that of the North Korean, or Korean, I should say, expatriate community in Japan. Let me play this clip for you. They have never lived in North Korea at the time, but they chose North Korea as their fatherland. Remember, when their families left Korea, it was one country. And then, in 1945, Korea was divided into the Communist North and the U.S. back South. The ethnic Koreans in Japan who weren't allowed to become Japanese citizens back then, now had a choice to make. And that means there are two separate Korean communities in Japan. So while technically living in Japan, Yong Hee grows up in a world within a world, the North Korean enclave inside Japan. Known as Zainichi, these ethnic Koreans in Japan attend special schools where the classes and the songs are in Korean and they study under the portraits of Kim Il-sung and Kim Jong-il. People really helped each other and then protected each other. That was a good part. But simultaneously, the saying any bad words about North Korea was strongly prohibited. We always had to show our loyal to the Kim family. I didn't like it. <laughs> so my parents are very passionate to do that. <laughs> my parents were that kind of people, but they, I was, uh, I couldn't be like that kind of person. Her parents would spend the rest of their lives working as pro-North Korean activists. My father's dream was um, sending their children to North Korea first and letting them get good education there because in Japan, everything is related to discrimination. So the edu getting education was also very difficult. Jean, I want to ask you to elaborate a little bit about the story and, and put it in context. We tend to think of North Korea today and its current state as, as kind of being always the way North Korea was, or at least in, in recent memory. But really, the 20th century was, and even just the last half of the 20th century, was a really complex story for North Korea and for the Korean people more broadly, including massive flows of the population in and out of Korea due to conflict in the region and numerous other factors, economic strain, et cetera. Tell us a little bit about the Korean expatriate community in different parts of Asia, around the world, really, and how they have developed relationships with North Korea that have in turn made them part of this story to some degree as well. Yeah. You know, I have to say that the episode where we get into that history of how 
we ended up with this Korean community in Japan was one of my favorites because it really is a community that's somewhat hidden that we don't hear much about and a community that I find very interesting, but a community that I also intersected with very regularly in Pyongyang. And so it was, I think, I, I do think it was worth it for us to really explore how the North Koreans are not only leaning on the network of middlemen in some of the Southeast Asian countries that they have relationships with, but also the network of ethnic Koreans. The story of the Koreans in the 20th century, it's tragic. Uh, this is a country, Korea is a country that had faced, you know, they call themselves a, sh a shrimp among whales, a tiny, tiny country, very strategically placed. The whales, of course, are China, Russia, Japan, and for thousands of years, we're really trying to exist. It was an existential, it was always an existential crisis. And the phrase, that proverb is that when the whales play, it's the shrimp that suffers. And really for the, for the Koreans for many, many years, it was an existential crisis to stay in existence by strategically playing off all these larger powers. When you look at that history, it's also easy to understand the approach that North Korea takes today. Uh, so what happened, of course, is after thousands of years of, of royal rule, the Japanese annexed and then colonized Korea. And uh, the colonization took place from 1910 to 1945 and really only ended when Japan surrendered during World War II and then, and then left Korea. Um, but during that period, you know, it was a really brutal colonial period. I do get into a little bit of that and how it related to my own family. My own family, my last name is Lee. Um, it's also known as Yi in Korean or E, and they were required to take on a Japanese name, for example. That's just something that all Koreans had to do. So really this attempt to blot out, wipe out Korean culture to justify the occupation of Korea. During this period, many, many Koreans were taken by force or went of their own volition to Japan. And many Japanese ended up, of course, in, a, in August of 1945, when the Japanese surrendered, there were many Koreans who were still in Japan. Of course, at the time, we forget that there was so much tumult on the Korean Peninsula. There was so much uncertainty about who was going to come in and, and what was going to happen in this sudden power vacuum. We had the Soviets come in from the north. We had the Americans come in from the south. And we saw this division of the Korean Peninsula in 1945. We, of course, know it as a divided peninsula, uh, but for five years until the Korean War broke out in 1950, there was a lot of confusion about what would happen to the Korean Peninsula and which of these forces would really take root. Now, the Korean War is really significant, 1950, 1953. Now, the North Koreans say that the South Koreans and the Americans started the war, uh, but the rest of us believe that it was the North Koreans who who launched the surprise attack in, 19, in June of 1950 and really triggered this, the start of a Cold War conflict that hasn't even ended today. What happened, you know, for, for both North and South Korea, they were, they were destroyed, absolutely devastated by this conflict. Millions died, Seoul was flattened, Pyongyang was just destroyed by bombs, by bombs from the US-led um, United Nations forces. Both countries were just left shattered, and it was unclear how they were going to rise from the ashes of this, this devastation. And until, this is the amazing thing, North Korea had the support of the Soviet Union, had the support of that communist network, and North Korea was the country that was able to rise more quickly. And until the early 1970s, had the stronger economy of the two Koreas. I know it's hard to believe, and during that period, these Koreans who were left in Japan had to choose which Korea to be loyal to. And for many of them, they saw this North Korean leader as being very persuasive, as representing a kind of 
true Korean spirit, right, and fighting off and fighting the Japanese. But also, it was it seemed to be the stronger of the two economies. So there is the community in Japan was split between those who allied, or I should say, were loyal to the North Korean regime, and those who were loyal to the South Koreans. And so we have two different communities of Koreans in Japan. Now the story, you know, it was this uh, Young Hee story, the filmmaker, is just particularly tragic, but I think really exemplifies the hard decision that these Koreans had to make. They decided, even though their roots were in South Korea, they decided that they would be loyal to the North Korean regime. And as a gift to the North Korean leader, her parents sent her three brothers to Pyongyang as human gifts for the leader's birthday, put them on a ship, sent them to Pyongyang, and they were raised and became North Koreans. And I think that story of how her family was split and the realization that her, that she and her parents made that the impact of what that decision would have, not only on their family, but on, on those three young men who were never able to really have the same kind of freedoms that they had growing in, up in Japan, I think really illustrates the complicated nature of what it means to be Korean in Japan. I should mention also, and we get into this in that episode, that the Koreans did face such extreme discrimination in Japan. They were treated like second-class citizens. And so they never fully integrated. They had no choice, frankly. When you're born in Japan, you are not a Japanese citizen. You were a South Korean citizen because they have relations with South Korea. And if you choose, you can become a North Korean citizen if you choose to be loyal to Pyongyang. Uh, but because of that history, the, the really complicated history of colonialism, the, the pattern of discrimination, Koreans feel a strong sense of pride and the Koreans in Japan and create their own communities. And so that I think will help us also understand why so many Koreans from that community also end up supporting the regime. And in, in Yang Hee's case, she did explain very clearly that for her parents, despite the disappointment that they felt in, in how their children were treated, they felt that the only thing that they could do to help their sons was to be more loyal to the regime. So it's really, really a, a heartbreaking story. But I think it was an opportunity for us to also explore this community that nobody really knows much about, right? It's not covered in our media. It's not really a, a community that we hear much about, but is still very integral to the North Korean regime. I should mention, I just want to, I know I've gone on for a long time on this, topic, but, but Kim Jong-un's mother comes from this community. And so there's another layer of history that intersecting with the Kim family today that I think we, 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 that we do cover and I think is really interesting as well. So this is a community that's important to him as well and a connection that is important to Kim Jong-un. Now, one thing you delve into a little bit in the podcast, I want to pull it out a little bit here, is about how this marginalization of the Korean population in Japan led to building some relationships with organized crime groups uh, or facilitated those a little bit. Can you elaborate a little bit on that, Jean? It was very difficult for Koreans to find legitimate ways to make a living in Japan because of the discrimination that they faced and one of the ways that they were able to make money was through these pachinko parlors. So I don't know if you're, are you familiar with pachinko or have you ever played it? I think from The Price is Right is about it, or I think they play a version of pachinko there. That's funny. I have been, and I, I, I do mention that I have been to a pachinko parlor, uh, and you see them all over uh, Japan. I didn't realize that so many of them were run by Koreans. But there's an amazing book called Pachinko by Min Jin Lee, a Korean American writer that delves into, I'm just mentioning it in case any of the listeners are interested in this history. It really illustrates and delves into that history of Koreans in Japan. And certainly a big chunk of that is the connection to North Korea. But it does become a way for Koreans to make a living in Japan. 
but because it's gambling i mean it's essentially it's like slot machines right so it is essentially a form of gambling the overlap with the yakuza who is japan's version of of gangs right involved in this dark underworld of criminal activity was perhaps inevitable and we did have an expert on the yakuza tell us that a significant number of the yakuza were ethnic koreans and so we wanted to explore that element of criminal activity just to see if there was a connection and to see if there might be a connection to how it was the North Koreans might be using them as middlemen in their effort to get the money out. And so this was, this was I think, worth exploring. And it was interesting and enlightening for me as well to look at those connections between the gambling world in Japan and that marginalization and the discrimination that you mentioned that drove them. And I think you know, there might be a parallel here with the North Koreans in a sense, not to justify or apologize or rationalize what the North Koreans are doing, but because of the extreme nature of sanctions over the years, sanctions that the North Koreans earned through their own provocation, that has driven them to look for much more illicit, quiet, forms of illicit activity that that we can't see that they can get away with and i think there is a parallel there in terms of when you are marginalized and i would say the north koreans are extremely marginalized when it comes to the international community uh, that you you will start to look for other ways just to survive that note of innovation uh an exploration you know, driven by the necessity, I think is a great segue to kind of the closing topic that that you all spend your last episode on, uh, and that's North Korea's potential involvement, uh, at least in the WannaCry ransomware attack, uh, a pretty devastating attack, as you all described. You all spend a good amount of time delving into a pretty difficult anecdote about people facing surgery in UK's health system, not being able to get necessary life-saving surgery in part because of the WannaCry ransomware attack shutting down the hospital computer system, just an example of the massive disruption that it brought on around the world, fortunately curbed in that case by the discovery of a, of a kill switch almost accidentally by an investigator. But nonetheless, this phenomenon of ransomware today has become very widespread, often associated with Russia, but with North Korea certainly as well, and is the latest innovation that's posing this major policy problem for not just businesses in the United States and other countries as well, but of course the government um, seeking to provide some degree of protection for them. Jeff, let me, let me ask you, what does North Korea's involvement, potential involvement, suspected involvement in these sorts of phenomena tell us about the future of North Korea's involvement in cybercrime? Where does it seem likely to go? How have the pushbacks and reactions to ransomware attacks, wanna cry, this other constellation of cyber criminal activities that we've seen building for the last few years, how has that, if at all, impacted North Korea's behavior so far and may yet do so moving forward? Yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, as you say, the wanna cry attack was, was one of the world's fastest spreading ransomware attacks. I mean, it was absolutely astonishing the speed with which that ransomware spread. But I think what's interesting about this is uh, I don't think that's triggered a huge wave of ransomware activity from North Korea's cyber, cyber attackers. As you say, there's, there's a phenomenal amount of ransomware going on at the moment. It is the cash cow for cyber criminals. But quite a lot of it uh, certainly is we believe developed in the in the Russian Federation. There are also gangs that use affiliate networks. So the software might be developed in one country, but is applied and, and, and spread by gangs working in other territories. That's all going on. But I, I don't get the sense that North Korea is too heavily involved in that. What I think came out of the WannaCry attack, and arguably maybe was the purpose of the whole thing, was how to target cryptocurrency. So Gene earlier on talked about uh, North Korea sort of trying to pick jurisdictions in the world where the, the, the legislation isn't quite so good and the regulation is not quite so good, picking soft spots effectively for corruption and for crime and, and targeting those countries and working with people in those countries. Well, it's sort of the same thing with the financial system, you know, as, as a cyber criminal looking for money. And if North Korea are indeed behind these cyber attacks, as a clear, as Gene's explained, money motivation for North Korean hackers to be doing that. If you're looking to make money, you're trying to target the bits of the financial system that are also weak and badly regulated and don't have much legislation. And frankly, at the moment, that is cryptocurrency. 
governments, including the US government, the UK government, are sort of struggling to get to grips with how cryptocurrency works, how it fits in with the current financial system. Companies are springing up right, left and centre. And because of the sort of phenomenal growth of the value, at least the paper value of some of these currencies, what you see is these startup companies getting hugely rich, hugely quick. Their security and their compliance and regulation doesn't often keep up and keep speed with that. So they become soft targets. So what North Korea's hackers are accused of, and it's not just them, it's lots of hackers around the world, they've found this soft spot in the financial system. And they are stealing absolute huge quantities of money from this. It's estimated something like $1.3 billion worth of cryptocurrency thefts. You know, you talk to people and they just they talk about hundred million dollars of thefts. You know, seventy million went here and five hundred million went there. It's astonishing amounts of money. And as Gene has described, you know, this money, if it is going back to North Korea, will partly be spent potentially on nuclear weapons and nuclear tests and missile tests. If not, maybe also spent on propping up the regime, on on paying off cronies and so on. So this money all goes back to those those purposes. But I just find it fascinating that what it points to is is. Is a, a regime whose who's, who's technologists, whose hackers, just seem absolutely on the cutting edge. Because frankly, there's, there's a frighteningly few, frighteningly small amount of people in the world who understand how cryptocurrency works. And on the level that these hackers are exploiting it at, that indicates that they really are on the cutting edge. They're keeping up with all the developments. And as soon as governments and cryptocurrency companies and so on put in place something to try and stop them and to get around this, the hackers are just leapfrogging it and going to the next stage and saying, oh, okay, we'll do a work around here. I think that's that's where the, the running is going to be made. And also, conveniently enough, we talked about some of the laundering tactics and the, the reliance on these criminal networks to get money across borders. Well, if you're looking at cryptocurrency, it's a hell of a lot easier. <laughs> you can wash cryptocurrency through multiple different companies and jurisdictions if indeed those companies have a jurisdiction at all, in in seconds. It's not like having to move money across a border in a suitcase, give it to some dude who runs it in a car to somebody else who spends on this. You don't need that anymore. Cryptocurrency offers this whole new way out. So I, I think it's I, I think this is where the running is going to be. So we have only had the opportunity to touch on a small part of this incredible web of stories that you guys have pulled together through this podcast series. And of course, that is just a part of a much broader set of stories, many of which you all probably had to clip and leave on the cutting room floor. Out of curiosity, what do you all have planned next, if anything, in this space? Are there plans for a season two of The Lazarus Heist or a related project? Because there seems to be lots more stories to keep exploring in this area. Well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the, the podcast series stops, as you said, in 2017 with the WannaCry uh, ransomware attack. There are something like four years worth more more stories to tell, including some ones I've alluded to in this in this interview. You know, the attack on the Indian bank, the cash points attacking, the cryptocurrency stuff. It's all there, and I don't think we break any trade secrets, Gene, to say that the plans are <laughs> afoot for for a season two to come next year. Yeah, you know, we were originally going to do a couple extra episodes, but. We actually have so much content. There was a lot of content that I didn't use, uh, many of my interviews that we didn't use in, the, in season one. So I'm looking forward to bringing them back for season two. And I hope, hopefully it will also get into some of the history the same way that we did in season one. So not only looking at what's transpired since WannaCry, but also going back in history as we did in season one with some of these very telling episodes We've done super notes, but we'll look for similar episodes that will help us will help us understand the history and the, and and the extent of investment in by the state by North Korea in coming up with ever more innovative and clever ways to make money. Well, that is phenomenal news for me, at least. Uh, as this was one of my favorite podcasts this year. I'm really excited about season two. For anyone who hasn't listened to The Lazarus Heist yet, be sure to hop on your nearest podcatcher or go to BBC or just search online for The Lazarus Heist. It's it's fairly easy to find. We'll have links in the show notes and we'll have to look forward to season two, but be sure to listen to season one to catch up before it comes out. But until then, unfortunately, we'll have to leave the conversation there. Jeff White, Gene Lee, thank you so much for joining us here today on The Lawfare Podcast. Thank you. Thanks so much. The Lawfare Podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brookings Institution. Please rate and review us on iTunes wherever you may have found us. 
Also, be sure to visit lawfareblog.com where you can read our written articles and analysis covering more of the national security issues addressed in this podcast. Or visit thelawfarestore.com where you can pick up some Lawfare-themed stocking stuffers from t-shirts to mugs. To get ad-free versions of this and other Lawfare podcasts, become a material supporter of Lawfare at patreon.com slash lawfare. You'll also get access to special events and other content available only to our supporters. This podcast is edited by Jen Patcha Howell, and our audio engineer this week was Kara Schillen of Goat Rodeo. Our music is performed by Sophia Yan. As always, thank you for listening.